we think of the world as complicated, like a clock, like a machine, like a car. Nature is not complicated. Nature is complex. And the difference is that if I took a part out of a car, it might not run. If you took a gear out of a watch, it's not going to keep time. If you injure the landscape, the landscape keeps on going. Nature is very careful in using materials and using energy in the right way. The material cycles, the energy cycles, the water cycle, the system should improve all the time and get stronger and better. And nature is built that way. I grew up on a ranch in South Texas. My family uh, actually homesteaded it in 1846. It was a lot more lush, clearly, at that time when they homesteaded than what I have today. I grew up loving the ranch. I was out there every day working cattle with my dad. It was instilled in me at a very young age to care for that land. The beginning of my journey into regenerative agriculture was wanting to rebuild the landscape where I grew up. Regenerative agriculture. First of all, we have to understand that it's, it's a principle. It means a systems approach to managing a landscape in a holistic way. Every time we put Papa. something yeah. in the ground that disturbs the soil and we break that top layer, that gives an opportunity for the wind to come in and blow our topsoil away. There are places where it blows away each year and it doesn't come back, you have to build it. There's lots of ways of doing that, but we think that using livestock and properly managing the livestock is the best way for us to improve the biodiversity and the health of the whole ecosystem. Set stocking, that's the traditional way of approaching ranch management. Dumping 500 cows out in a pasture and just letting them stay there all year long. Regenerative land management, especially with cattle, is basically a rancher letting cattle graze for a very short period of time, and then they move off for a long resting period so the vegetation can restore. The bison were here once, and so we have to replicate what they did for the land with domestic livestock. Animals aren't meant to stay in the same place. Yeah, and the land needs rest as well. The animals, we can keep them moving, right? mimicking their natural behavior. The wild animals have no reason to come back to an area where they've been until everything's regrown. I'm a really firm believer of the essence of an animal. Part of that is doing pasture grazing. We give them space, we open it up. They're rotationally grazed. We put them on different fields all the time. The cattle actually will work with you. They know they're moving to a better pasture. And we're trying to really promote a biodiverse ecosystem. Being a livestock farm, the majority of our land is pasture, so that means grass. My model has always been that buckaroos go out and look at the cattle and could care less about the grass. The rancher goes and looks at the grass. And by looking at the grass, he can tell you what the cattle are doing. But you look at the grass first. I'm out here measuring how much grass we have right here. And the measurement that we're using is what we call a stock day, okay? So a stock day is how much one of our animals is gonna eat mm -hmm. in each day. And we're measuring how many of those are in each acre of this ranch. And we have a real sophisticated tool for doing that. Okay. It's my boot. What? Yeah, just my boot, <laughs> okay? If the grass comes up to the top of the sole of my boot right uh -huh. here, that's 12. 12 right? stock That's 12 days. stock days okay. on each acre of this land, and then we can extrapolate that out to the whole ranch. It allows us to make data-driven decisions as to how much grass we can harvest. The approach that we take allows plants like this to really thrive, and because it's getting to rest, right? So it's getting to reboot itself and put out a seed head. Where we're standing, how it looks rooted up, uh, we move them every so often, every couple weeks, and we move them onto something that looks like this. We didn't touch this at all this year. That is like the picture of biodiversity. If you keep animals on grass, it will kill it. But if you bring animals on the grass and then take them away, it's like you're starting spring over. When they eat the top off of this plant, some of the roots die back in the soil. They're typically just taking the top third or so. And that allows for the grasses to recover very quickly. Mm -hmm. What grass does, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing organism for the environment. If you start managing grasslands in a different way, you can store tremendous amounts of carbon. This is all based on photosynthesis, where CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, reacts with water in the green parts of the plant. When the grass is green, 
it's taking the sunlight and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right, and storing it in the soil. Few people realize that there's more carbon in the first three feet of soil than all the atmospheric carbon and all the biomass combined. Every acre of grass takes 3,500 pounds of atmospheric carbon and puts it right into the ground a year. 72 tons of atmospheric carbon every year that I put down back into the ground where it belongs. There's an enormous amount of land available for carbon storage. 40% of the United States is being used for livestock management. My family has a small cow-calf operation in West Texas. I had always grown up where you're just fighting the land, you're fighting nature, and the idea of being able to work with nature to be so effective to store carbon, you're improving the water cycle and water retention, so you have less flooding, you're more drought resistant, improved biodiversity, all of these things, that was just mind-blowing. Healthy soils with thriving microorganisms and thriving root systems and a lot of carbon almost act like a sponge. It really keeps water in the soil, and that makes all the difference when there is a drought. Drought is just a thing that plagues us all. They're not making any more land, and in the West, they're not making any more water. And so you need to take what you have and improve upon it, become more efficient, and conserve and protect it. Water is precious. You graze the ground down, the water just runs off. But if you have those deep-rooted grasses, water can follow the roots down. When we keep green plants on the planet's surface, we hold more water, we hold a more constant temperature, and we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, we're putting it into the soil. Literally more food can be grown. When you move your animals every day, you're growing two and a half times more forage, and that's like having two and a half times more land. The type of management we do with regenerative grazing, it allows us to typically, over a period of time, increase the stocking rate of a ranch almost twofold, which is pretty incredible on a bottom line perspective. So at the end of the day, ranching is a business. And a beautiful thing with what they're doing of this intense regenerative grazing is they're improving that property value too. They're improving the forage, they can stock more cattle, so they're increasing the profitability. Building a scaled regenerative grazing business, the livestock is the byproduct of that business. We need supply chain all over the United States for it, right? From birth to finish, regenerative beef supply chain. So that's, that's kind of our mission and what we're out to do. We continue to try to make sure that we are taking care of the animals as well as the earth. We feel like, you know, amazingly grateful for their ability to transform grass nutrients and clover nutrients into fuel for our bodies. People that become vegans and vegetarians because they think, well, I can't eat animals because of the way that they're raised. Well, what if we raise them in a way that actually heals the planet and all of a sudden we have a win-win for everybody? In principle, it's, it sounds not that difficult, but it is basically managing your land in such a different way than your grandparents have been doing, your parents have been doing it, how your neighbors are doing it. Where I get a lot of grief from older farmers or more of the industrial farmers, like if you look out at my fields, you're gonna see what they deem weeds. Well, I see flowering plants and what those flowering plants do is support the bees bees support all running life in the entire world. So yeah, I'll let my grass get a little bit bigger, but we're supporting a bigger ecosystem. And that's part of what stewardship is, is adapting. I had to learn all about what nature was telling me. How can you remove barriers? How can you make this accessible to landowners and basically unlock this enormous solution at the scale that really matters? We try to make it much easier for landowners and land stewards to get paid for the carbon they actually store in their healthy soils. We find companies, individuals, you name it, folks who are looking to reduce their carbon footprint, and we work to get carbon credits to them. Each credit represents one metric ton of sequestered carbon. We take care of the measurement of the soil carbon. You have to build a lot of trust and a lot of transparency to basically show what you're doing. So we answer to that with strong measurements. We want to know exactly how much carbon there is in soil. You actually go into an analyzer, an elemental mm -hmm. combustion analyzer. The soil in there is actually going in the analyzer, being combusted. You burn basically the carbon away. Okay. The analyzer measures how much CO2 there is, and that's a wow. very accurate way to determine how much carbon loss there actually in soil. Soon you realize some, this is unbelievable, the change you can create, but there's so much money for landowners to actually pay them for the change they create. It's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, economically, ranching is already a difficult equation. So 
If there is money out there to be had to pay me what we already do, I'm all for it. What we're looking at is change at a scale that matters. We want that 40% of the U.S. land mass that is devoted to agriculture to be working regeneratively. If we restore just half of the U.S. grasslands, we can sequester half to over a billion tons of CO2 per year. The solution is right under your feet and people just walk over it. Eight years ago, I never told about soil in my life. Since then, uh, I think about soil almost every day and every hour. I've been lucky enough to steward this land for the amount of time I'm here. If someone gave you the tools, you would do the same. Mm -hmm. And regenerative agriculture is another tool. You can't walk the land and not want to do something to make it better. It's about sustainability. Something that we have taken, discovered what it will do, enhance that, build it up, make it better, set the standard for whoever's going to take my place. And that's what heritage is all about. Our kids are going to inherit the earth. What is the state of the earth going to be when my great grandchildren are here? I have three boys. I take a lot of pride in being a dad and trying to raise them right. If I can instill anything in them, it is just to learn to take care of the land. And if you take care of the land and the planet, you know, for, for everybody, it's gonna take care of us in return. Every time I come out here, something's better. And some days you move the needle a lot, and other days you might just make one teeny little thing. But over a lifespan, you can see incremental changes for the better. Nature's beautiful in that, that you provides so much, mm -hmm. you just have to have the vision mm. to see it.